stay tuned for an exclusive interview with Dr. Teresa Tam, the Chief Public Health Officer of Canada. The fast fashion industry is one of the largest contributors to the climate crisis. It is worth over a billion dollars, yet it is one of the most underpaying employers. Fast fashion is the cheap clothing you buy just to wear once or twice to partake in a trend and then toss when it's no longer in style. The scientific definition is inexpensive clothing produced rapidly by mass market retailers in response to the latest trends. Everyone does this, why is it so bad? Well, fast fashion contributes to materialism, consumerism, and commercialism. Clothing is bought because people can, and they don't think about the effect it has on the planet, or even the attitude of shopping in general. Currently, North Americans send 10 million tons of clothing to the landfill each year, 95% of which could have been reused or recycled. In regards to the environment, fashion is the second most polluting industry in the world right after oil. Annually, the fashion industry produces about 14 items per person on Earth, with 60% of it being incinerated within a year. The world consumes 80 billion pieces of clothing each year, and the fashion industry brings in $1.2 trillion. Overproduction and overconsumption have led to fashion being one of the highest polluters in the world. It takes 2,700 liters of water to produce a single cotton t-shirt. That's the same amount of clean water a person drinks in three years. Fast fashion brands cut costs by outsourcing manufacturing to countries with loose or completely without labor laws. 40 million people are making our clothes today. 80% is made by women who are only 18 to 24 years old. In many factories in developing countries, labor standards are so low that even though the apparel industry is the number one employer of women globally, less than 2% of these women make a living wage. Due to demand, 250 million children starting at age five have been forced to work in sweatshops in developing countries. This is still going on today. You may be asking yourself if this has been going on for so long, why do we worry now? It's because fast, the fast fashion industry is completely supported by the growing influencer culture. Brands provide accessible garments and with the advent of online shopping, consumption has been made 10 times easier. Now, how do we avoid fast The first step to avoiding fast fashion is to reduce. We reduce by buying less clothes and shopping sustainable. When you shop sustainable and ethical, you buy less pieces that last longer. The cheapest and most effective way to avoiding fast fashion is to reuse. We reuse by shopping at local thrift stores or big corporation thrift stores like Value Village. If you're looking for specific items, you can go online and you can thrift online at Depop or ThreadUp, where anyone can sell their secondhand clothing. The last step to avoiding fast fashion is to recycle. You can recycle your clothes by donating them to donation bins donating them to thrift stores, or selling them on the websites I mentioned before. This prevents your clothes from going into landfills and hurting the environment. If you're wondering which clothing brands to avoid and which clothing brands you should be shopping at, you can go onto the website Good On You, which tells you how sustainable each clothing brand is. The earth does so much for us and it's time for us to give back. Climate change is a huge threat and the mistreatment of workers in this industry needs to stop. Any small steps against avoiding fast fashion helps. What changes are you going to make? Why do I need a vaccine? What are vaccines? Aren't COVID-19 vaccines dangerous? New Brunswick has started the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines. This has been a very controversial topic. Many people question if these new vaccines are safe. In this segment, we will learn how COVID-19 vaccines work, and we will also find out if it is important for young people to be vaccinated. There are many different types of COVID-19 vaccines, but today we'll be talking about the messenger RNA vaccines. Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna's new COVID-19 vaccine use this method. How do mRNA vaccines work? First off, we need to understand what a messenger RNA is. 
It is a molecule that carries the genetic code to produce proteins. A key thing to recognize is that on the surface of the COVID-19 virus, there are spike-like structures called S-proteins. The mRNA vaccine gives cells instructions to produce a harmless piece of S-protein. After vaccination, the cell produces this protein and puts it on the surface of the cell. Your immune system will then take over from here. It will recognize that the S proteins in your body don't belong there and begin building an immune response. Now that we know a little bit more about the mRNA vaccines, we still have a few questions. We interviewed Dr. Teresa Tam, Canada's Chief Public Health Officer. She gave us amazing answers on vaccines and other important topics. Some students at our school are unsure of whether or not to get the vaccine and if it is safe for our students. Um, so what would be your thoughts on this? Well, I think the vaccines, COVID-19 vaccines, is an example of tremendous scientific collaboration uh, globally. And I was really, um, actually, I was pretty emotional, actually, when I saw the results of the initial um, clinical trials of the vaccine. It's just how good they are at um, saving lives and preventing severe illness, preventing deaths, as well as um, preventing infections. And so it, it was, it's, it's, we're really fortunate to actually have a vaccine um, developed so fast during the pandemic. But it's also done with uh, safety in mind um, so that vaccines don't get authorized by Health Canada, um, our regulatory um, agency, if you like, our regulatory authority uh, for use in Canada unless they meet the safety uh, requirements as well. And so they look at all the studies they look at real life um, sort of use of vaccines and what happens uh, with effectiveness of the vaccine and the safety of the vaccine all along the way. So I think we, we have a really robust system to ensure that uh, the vaccines um, are safe and effective. Um, but the vaccines are, are authorized at the moment um, are really uh, two of them are for uh, authorized for individuals 18 years and over. And one of them, the Moderna vaccine, is for 16 years and over. So, uh, but there's uh, actual clinical trials in uh, younger populations. So we're expecting um, um, the submission for uh, one of the vaccines uh, for um, individuals 12 to um, 16 years of age. So 12 to 15, and so it's the bridging that gap in the information. Um, so, so soon we will have vaccines authorized uh, for younger individuals. And there will then be trials uh, starting right now for even younger kids. And so at the moment, if you are uh, 16 years or over, or um, depending on the vaccine being used uh, in your uh, area, um, you know, you may be eligible when your time comes uh, for getting the vaccine. So I think my, my fundamental message uh, for everyone is that, of course, while COVID-19 um, does not um, impact kids and youth, uh, teens, uh, as, as much as older, our seniors and our elders, uh, in terms of severity, uh, anyone of any age could get severely ill. It's, it's much more rare. Um, but you also um, get the vaccine because you would prevent uh, transmission to your family, those people that you care about, your teachers and others. Uh, many teens go out to work. Um, and of course, in those kind of social and work interactions, uh, the virus can be transmitted. So if everybody is protected, uh, you don't only just get individual protection, you protect each other as well. And so that's really important to remember. Um, so, but, but the safety um, is uppermost in our minds. So um, Health Canada would not authorize vaccines that are not safe, but every medicine, every vaccine could have side effects. Of course, that's just part of um, what is to be expected. And so if you did get a vaccine, expect a sore arm, some people get a fever, aches and pains, and feeling tired, but those shall pass. Some people might be allergic to the vaccine. So this is why um, 
you know, if it, when you go to a vaccine clinic, people want you to sit there for at least 15 minutes so that if you did develop any allerg allergic reactions, there's treatment for that. And so, um, so I think my message is, of course, to everyone who's eligible for the vaccine to roll up their sleeves, because it really would help us uh, regain some of the, the normalcy um, of the things that we, we love to do. Uh, and we have been, you know, before the pandemic, and but everybody has to do it. Absolutely. And only up until like a couple months ago, we would have asked you what the point of high school students getting vaccinated was due to the severity of the symptoms, because they're usually lower for us. Um, but due to these new variants that are out, which can be quite scary and very uncertain, um, what is the point of us getting vaccinated now today? Um, so you've been reading about variants. <laughs> That's very interesting. So uh, viruses mutate and that's just part of the biology of the viruses as they undergo evolution. The more infection there is, so the, the higher rates of infection there are, the virus will mutate more. So the most important thing is to prevent the virus from mutating really fast just by clamping down on the level of infections in communities. So that's one thing is prevention. Secondly is that when you do have variants of concern, uh, what do we mean by that? Well. Um, so, so various variants of concern are the ones where compared to pre-existing viruses, they, they transmit easier, so they spread faster. And some of them um, have signs that they may cause more severe illness. And some of them uh, that we're monitoring uh, might impact the effectiveness of the vaccines. Although we expect the vaccines to still work, maybe the effectiveness will go down. And so that's why we're tracking all of these uh, viruses and um, over time. So what I would say is that if we look at the impact of one of the variants that is sort of really spreading uh, faster than others, the B117 variant originally, originally identified by scientists and public health in the United Kingdom, this variant um, seems to, at least according to data in, in uh, some countries and in Ontario, cause more severe outcomes, uh, even in younger populations. We love Dr. Tam's answers on vaccines and advice for high school students. We are so grateful to have had the opportunity to interview such an important figure in medicine. We hope that you can all take something from our interview and even apply it to your day-to-day -day lives. We hope you are now informed about the vaccines. We also owe Vicki Hogarth and the entire CHCO crew a huge thank you for helping us land this interview and also letting us come into their studio. Courses, 20 credits, 20 teachers to listen to. That's what you need to graduate, right? Wrong. There's two common paths to graduate high school, either the science and math path or the trading path, which is carpentry or welding. But in recent times, we've seen that there's a lot of different ways to learn via online learning, hands-on learning, and just sitting in a classroom and learning. But we now have a new course that is increasingly popular at our school. Essential skills. Essential skills is based on the 12 essential skills. Reading text, document use, numeracy, motor skills, and critical thinking, and so much more. You can develop essential skills by doing projects in a classroom, and your teacher will guide you to help you out with your projects. Students who are in the Essential Skills program will be right on track to college, apprenticeships, and straight into the workforce. Why? This is because the essential skills are exactly what employers are looking for. Students who go in this program will go in in the second semester of their grade 10 year because the program is two and a half years long and it takes up most of their courses and replaces their credits. But that's enough from us. We will now go talk to Mr. Heise, who's the teacher in charge of the Essential Skills program at our school. And action. 
Okay, so the Essential Skills uh, Program, it's a, it's a pathway to graduation. Um, it's two and a half years in length, um, and it's a personalized skills-based program um, that students would start in the second semester of grade 10. The whole idea is to be able to allow the students to kind of explore different areas that they enjoy um, and do hands-on stuff. Like it, it's, it's a different uh, setup right from the get-go. I'm not providing really any work for them. I'm not giving them stuff. I'm asking them, what do you want to do? Um, and they have, uh, in the first year of the program, it's called the foundational pathway, and they have all these essential outcomes that they need to get. They need to create activities um, and things that they do, or projects, um, hopefully that they enjoy, th that they can get these essential skills. Um, after the first year of the foundational pathway, we have a, a post-secondary or a work experience pathway, which is more focused on exactly where they want to, be, want to be. So in the first year, they could look up maybe a few different trades, maybe look up, look into forestry, and then by the second year, hopefully they decided what they want to do, um, and they'd be able to explore that even further and more focused in the second part of the pathway. And they do that for a year, um, and they meet uh, some more essential outcomes and gain some more essential skills. Um, and then in the last half of grade 12, they do what it's called a capstone project, which is a personalized project, something that's going to improve your community, your province, your country, your world, uh, something that solves a real world problem. Um, and then after that, they walk out of here with a high school uh, diploma and uh, they can go to college, they can go to university, or they can go into the workforce. And they'll have these essential skills that both post secondary schools and the employers have said we want students coming out of high school with. Um, and it'll be in a real focused way, and hopefully, they'll have that. Uh, and there'll be a step up on uh, most other students that are coming out. That's cool. Um, so I know you said like, so, so your end project is like that real world, how to make the world better. Yep. What are some examples of Well, we haven't done one yet because we're only in the second year of our program. So we just started our second year. So I have nobody that's done a capstone. But some examples of some capstone projects that uh, students have done across the province where they've been running this program for a little bit longer. Um, I've heard about somebody taking old bikes and fixing up old bikes and then donating them. Uh, to a boys and girls club. Um, people that uh, could, they were building uh, garden boxes for folks that might not have an opportunity to garden. Um, anything, and, and hopefully it's within that area that you want it. So obviously somebody who might be interested in carpentry, they might go build the boxes. Somebody who might be interested in mechanics, they might have fixed up a bike. They've had people that have fixed up cars, fixed up motorcycles, and then sold them and donated the money to a cause in their community. Um, and things like that. And I think the projects would be as varied as there are you know, different personalities within in the program. Well, that's so awesome. Thank you so much for... No trouble. Thanks, Thanks for uh, checking in. Why did you decide to join the Central Skills? Um, I was approached by one of my teachers and uh, he thought it'd be a great opportunity for me uh, as an alternative pathway to, to, to graduate and uh, I took a chance on it and I, I really do like it. Uh, I think it suits me really well and it really helped me explore my other opportunities other than just going the straight normal way to a high school diploma and graduate. It really opened my eyes to maybe doing something that I like and I could follow my passion and uh, I'm really grateful for it. I really like it a lot. And what projects are you doing right now? Um, well currently we're kind of just feeling at the basics of, of, the, of the program. We've been doing a couple things to get used to it but now we're getting to the point where it's you know okay what do we want to do and start looking at the projects that we want to do ourselves and uh, I've been looking into getting into some workplace activities, maybe getting into the mechanic world and seeing how that fits me and seeing if maybe that is what I want to do. And uh, yeah, that's kind of where I'm going from here. Nice. Hey, what are some of your first impressions of the program? Um, well, if I'm being honest, at first I was kind of shaky because I wasn't sure. But I gave it some time, I warmed up to it, and now it's become a custom. I, I love it, and uh, it's it's my normal day now, and it suits me perfectly as a person. It may not be for everyone, but it certainly helps me with my education, and I am super grateful for it. And how do the classes look like? Um, well, it kind of depends on what you want to do, uh, but there's a, at fourth period, you have a whole class here where you come in and sometimes you're either sitting down and working in your book or you're out doing things most times, you know. Uh, you're outside, you're in a workplace, you're doing activities, those kind of things and doing what you want to do and doing what you think is going to help you later on in life. Thank you so much. No problem. Anytime. That was really good. I hope we were able to educate you about essential skills and the other options when it comes to education. If you're looking for a job in trades, Essential Skills is the way to go. Coming of age movies and high school TV shows will never stop being popular.
The excitement and fun is completely timeless, and they make being a high schooler look like a dream. But in reality, it's full of stress, homework, jobs, complicated friendships, mental health problems, and so much more. I know my life can feel pretty repetitive sometimes. I come to school, I go home, I go to work, and I do homework. It can feel like a never-ending loop. We talked to some teenagers at St. Stephen High School about what their lives are really like and what experiences they think are unique to our generation. So, you can just start off by introducing yourself. I'm Ashlyn, I'm in grade 10, and I'm 15 years old. Um, I'm Jet, I'm a grade 11 student, and I'm 17 years old. I'm Matthew, I'm a grade 11 student, and I'm 17 years old. I'm Ryan, I'm in grade 11, and I'm 16. I'm Max, I'm in grade 11, and I'm 17. Hi, I'm Nathan Crowley Peters, I am a grade 11 student, and I'm 16 years old. Hi, my name is Seamus Goss, and I'm currently in grade 12. And I'm Hope Dago, I'm also in grade 12. Alright, so to start off, what do you think people misunderstand about being a teenager? How much time we have? I don't, I think, I think our parents say we have more time than we actually do. When it comes to a lot of us have jobs and schoolwork, and a lot of kids play sports, like I play too. So, balancing all of that out and maintaining high grades is harder than that seems. It definitely has its ups and downs with like goofy moments and then serious kind of moments. Just the amount of stress that we have. The value of time is definitely different. Like I feel like a lot of adults look at us like we can work all the time and balance job and school and all that stuff and be expected to do it and literally not take any time for anything else. They're like, oh, well you have plenty of time. You don't. Yeah, back on your point about like having time for yourself. like. I think mean, that's probably the biggest misconception because we have to have personal time to, uh, I guess, have a little bit of happiness to maintain our work ethic. Okay, so when you take that into consideration, I think almost like High School Musical, but it's not like that. Um, a lot of my time is spent trying to maintain my grades and keep them where they are, as well as getting involved in the school and doing what I want to do. I thought it'd be easier, <laughs> but um, no, medium based it looks a lot easier than it actually is. It's like getting your license, trying to do all your courses, getting to university. Yeah. It's a lot harder than it looks. Uh, it's not just a straight path. There's a lot of curves and obstacles in the way that you gotta go around. <laughs> well, it's it's very different from what I thought it would be growing up. I thought it would be you know just having so much time to spend with friends and things like that and have a lot of fun, and some people say it's the, supposed to be the best years of the life, the media anyways, but it's like the quickest ones of your life basically. And you know, it's, it's difficult to just stop and take it all in for a second, because uh, you have so many other things to focus on. When I, when I was like a young kid, I thought it was going to be sick, I thought I was going to be ripping fat kick flips on my skateboard, I don't know. But I can tell you now that it's a lot more work than I thought it would be. And definitely once you reach 13, 13 till I guess 20, those seven years are like some of the defining years of your life. And some of the worst or best things can happen to you. And it can either send you on a downhill path or an uphill path. And I guess some kids are on a downhill path and some kids are on an uphill path. Yeah. <laughs> It's definitely, like, in the media, as you mentioned, it's, like, super idealized, and it definitely seems like kids who just kind of skate through school, they're not, like, when you see it in, like, TV shows and stuff, it's not kids, a lot of kids, like, pressure to do really well, or doing really bad, it's just kind of, whatever, they have money so they don't have part-time jobs, and they don't have to worry about school, and they're just kind of chilling, and it's definitely not like that, it's a lot, like, less fun. It's so much less fun than I thought. Yeah. Like, you feel like you're going to be with your friends every day and having a good old time, but if you're actually trying to do well and with your academics and it doesn't come super easy, it's awful. Yeah. And it's not just like chilling all the time. It's not straight J chilling. It's not straight J chilling at all. Perfect. And what issues do you face that you think is specific to this time in your life and to our generation? Uh, I think the main thing would be uh, mental health issues. I know there's a lot of people um, that you know are experiencing depression, anxiety, um, those are the two big ones, especially right now with everything that we have to worry about. It's, it's, it's a lot, I mean, just for anyone in general, not even teenagers, just 
and uh, going along with the stereotype that teenagers, you know, don't have as many things to focus on, our emotions and our well-being, it gets dismayed basically and put away because they're just like, oh, well, you don't have that many things to worry about. You know, you're just a teenager, but it's, I mean, it's affecting us, you know, as much, if not more, because we have to worry about other things like where we want to go, what we want to do for the rest of our lives. These are the deciding years of our lives, basically, and we're supposed to act like everything's okay and everything's fine, that, you know, we're not struggling with this stuff, and it's, I mean, yeah. Uh, addiction to social media, 100%. Um, I remember the uh, days before um, social media, like early 2010s, late 2000s, people would not nearly be on their phone as much as they are now. People are just on their phones all the time, not focused on what's around them. And if you don't have what they have, it's kind of annoying seeing all these people with their devices. Um, everything with COVID, <laughs> it just makes it 10 times harder. Basically like going to school every other day and having your mask on, it's just, it's harder to learn, honestly. Yeah, I agree with the COVID, like online schooling, like half the time I don't pay attention when I'm at home, so it's, you learn at 50%, so it's, it's rough. I think just being expected to balance so much really, because if you're our age and working, it takes, you have school and then you're almost doubling that if you work any substantial amount of time. Yeah. And then the school, the homework on top of that, and especially this year, the homework seems worse, um, the homework on top of that is also multiple hours. And if you have a job and you're trying to do all that, that's just something I feel like you don't have so many things going on at another, po another point in your life. And then like if you do that for long enough, you get burnt out and then you suffer from a lack of motivation. And then people are left wondering like, oh, what happened to you? You used to be smart. Why aren't you getting your work done? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? And you're pushed into that position by the people who want you to do good. Yeah, not having the time to do anything but the different forms of work and like minimal time doing anything else. It just like burn out a few times a year and it's awful. <laughs> like it's awful. Yeah, you do burn out a few times a year. Yeah, you can't be expected. If you're actually spending a lot of like Time and, time and effort into your education and then also in if work. you're expected to have a job or even like sports and other stuff like that you have to balance it's yeah, yeah. you just it's you're destined to burn out and do all the home and you're trying to get your all your everything done all the homework and everything you're destined to crash multiple times related to burning out do you guys want to talk about mental health the, the resources there just don't work for everybody and i feel like the support systems aren't strong enough that are in place. Kids also have to balance their well-being and be able to function when they show up at school every day. And I don't know what the solution is, but it's not its not in place for a lot of kids. And it's definitely not what we're doing currently. Yeah, not for most people. We really appreciate the honesty coming from our fellow Spartans. We hope to talk more about how mental health services can improve and better serve high school students. And we also want to shed light on some more positive aspects of being a teenager. Thank you for watching Spartan TV. We really hope that you feel you're getting to know the students at St. Stephen High School.